Hello friends, I hope you are doing well. Uh, I hope you are <laughs> doing better than I am. Uh, I'm wearing my hat today because I... <laughs> I gave myself a haircut and I, I am not prepared to show that to the world. Um, stupid coronavirus. We are going to be looking at the final 10 chapters of Come Closer. I, I hope you like the book. I hope it provided a few surprises. A couple of you sent me messages that it spooked you when you were reading it. I totally relate. The first time I read it, it scared me too. Um, and I want to start with sort of an unusual question. That might not seem related, but it, but it will. Um, and that question is, why, why do we lie? Because we lie a lot, you and I. We do. From little white social lies to bigger, more substantial lies that could potentially do some damage to ourselves and to people we care about. Why do we do that? Well, I'm going to put up some reasons right here. So these are the main reasons that we pesky human beings tend to lie. Uh, the first reason is to take what is not ours. Uh, number two, to escape accountability, so not take responsibility for our own actions. Um, number three, to create a fantasy in order to create an otherwise sort of dull and boring life. Number four, to avoid punishment. Number five, to inflict pain onto other people. Number six, to gain admiration or feel good about ourselves. Sometimes we lie to make ourselves seem, seem better than we really are. And finally, to gain advantage to exploit others. In other words, sometimes we lie just to hurt others and we get something out of that. There's a currency there. Um, maybe someone has lied about you in order to get something that they wanted. But these tend to be the seven main reasons that we lie. Now, if I were to ask you if any of these things apply to Amanda, you can probably check off every single one of these reasons we lie and connect them to, to some event that happens in the story. I mention all of this because we need to approach these final chapters of Amanda's story uh, with a little more caution. Uh, for example, um, if we look at the different ways that Amanda has tried to cure herself, she returns to Sister Maria's house. Uh, but if you remember, Sister Maria would not let her in because Maria sees the demon and she sees that it has gotten significantly stronger than the last time she saw it. So Maria won't even let Amanda into her home because she doesn't want Amanda around herself or her children or her family inside the house. But Maria does give her sort of an extra strength potion um, that Amanda goes outside and she pours it all over her head. But right at that moment, the sky sort of magically opens up and it starts pouring rain and it washes away the cure. Now that could seem very supernatural, right? That this, this rain opens up and blocks the cure that would make the demon go away. And Amanda sees it that way. She certainly sees it as this paranormal, supernatural event. But what else could it be? Just a coincidence, right? I mean, coincidences do happen. Maybe it was just a rainy day and she chose the wrong moment to try and, and treat herself. We also see Amanda trying to buy more books in order to help herself, but it seems like every move she makes, Nama is doing everything she can to sabotage Amanda and to keep her from getting rid of this demon. So all the books that Amanda buys end up being burned in fires or <laughs> lost or destroyed in some way. And every time she tries to reach out for help, whether it's making an appointment for more therapy or even just walking into the doors of a church, Nama stops Amanda every single time, stops her from doing those steps that could help her. Again, Amanda says it's very paranormal. It was Nama's control over her. Or does Amanda just not want to do those things? She's not really maybe looking for a cure as, as much as she thinks she is, or as much as she's trying to convince us that she is. Amanda tries to tell Ed everything at this point. She wants her husband to know that she feels like she's possessed and that's why all these terrible things are happening. But she stops herself again because Ed and Amanda, they're barely speaking to each other at this point, you know, let alone confiding in each other. Their marriage has deteriorated to the point where they're just sort of living under the same roof. They're just existing. 
but they have no connection to one another. And so she's not able to reveal to Ed how her psychic abilities, remember how she's able to touch things and sort of get a picture of the story of that thing, whatever the object is. That ability, according to Amanda, is getting more and more violent. Uh, for example, she puts on that yellow dress that used to belong to an alcoholic, again, according to Amanda, um, who could be just making up these stories. But she's feeling them. Remember that perception is reality? She perceives it to be true. And when she puts on this yellow dress, her liver begins to burn. She can feel her body burning from the inside out, um, which is how alcoholics feel when their organs start to shut down. Uh, at another point in the story, she puts her hand on some dry blood in a house that she's visiting. And it turns out that two brothers had a fight in this property, and one ended up stabbing the other to death. Just off the top of your head, can you think of another pair, very famous pair of brothers, where one turned on the other? Well, in the world of Come Closer here, we're dealing with some biblical images. Because remember, Nama was one of Adam's first wives. Well, this little scene with the brothers, I think, if we interpreted this correctly, is supposed to create this image for us of the biblical Cain and Abel. They were Adam and Eve's sons, and one brother killed the other. So again, we have these religious images uh, coming to us out of this story, which connects right back to Nama. Now, Nama tells Amanda, I can't have fun without you. Well, what kind of fun does she have in mind? Well, if you remember back to what we learned about Nama's origin story, her entire identity is sort of wrapped up in, in sexuality, right? And these are the same urges that Amanda herself is feeding into right now. Amanda attends a party where she meets a handsome young man and decides she wants to have casual sex with him. And they find a little remote place to, to hide and get down to business. Uh, and she gets very violent with him. She scratches his back really hard. She ends up biting his lip to the point where he bleeds. And this ends up not being a very <laughs> pleasurable experience for the young man. In fact, the guy is pretty grateful when a janitor, I think, comes along <laughs> and kind of turns the hose on him and, and breaks him up. She says that she hates all of this, Amanda does, and she claims that she doesn't want any of this. However, at one point, Nama tells her, I never made you do anything. I only let you do what you wanted. Well, if that's not the demon speaking to her, then what else could that be? Perhaps Amanda is just indulging in her id. Remember that part of her that has sort of the basic human instincts, those raw needs that we all need? If, if you and I, if we indulge our ids, if we get what we want when we want it, how does that make us feel? Usually pretty good. Before we totally leave the issue of Amanda's sexuality, I kind of want to hit the pause button right now on, on our book talk and show you really briefly what Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis says about sexuality. Um, again, a lot of what Freud did we still use today in English, but a lot of his his theories, especially those about our developing sexuality, have not aged well over time. Uh, and I, th I think you'll see why. Of course, the best and most lasting part of Sigmund Freud's contributions has been the actual act of therapy, the talking cure. And this is where you go to visit your therapist, your psychologist, and you just talk. And you don't censor yourself. You don't try and cover up what you're saying. Just let it all out. Be open and honest and truthful. And while you're talking, the therapist is listening and writing down any patterns or symbols and trying to decode those symbols. Because by making sense of the symbols, perhaps the therapist can get to the true heart of the problem. Uh, and then you and your, your therapist would be able to work together to confront those problems and finally just banish them all together to try and get past them, right? Grow from them, get rid of them. If you remember, though, Sigmund Freud was working back during the Victorian era, so we're talking late 1800s or so. Uh, and when he was dealing with what he considered were hysterical female patients, remember, any time a woman had any kind of issue whatsoever, she was just dismissed as, oh, just hysterical. Um, but from his treatment of female patients, Freud decided that all trauma, all original trauma, is based on sex. 
Um, it's pretty horrendous because when female patients told Freud about having been sexually molested by older trusted male figures in their life, Freud completely dismissed them. And he said, no, that didn't happen to you. In fact, you're fantasizing. You wish it would happen to you. What you're really saying is you want the love of your father. So instead of taking the very serious claims of women who would have been sexually assaulted, he completely wrote them off and said, no, no, that's not true. You're just secretly wishing for that. And from that, that awful misinterpretation, comes the Oedipus complex, and this is something we'll talk more about in just a second. According to psychoanalysis, we are all, all of us, pleasure-seeking animals. We want to do what feels good. And according to Freud, all pleasure, no matter what kind it is, all pleasure stems from sexual pleasure. So anytime you're in a really good mood, you're just feeling very joyful, that's sexual or the thrill you get from riding on a roller coaster or maybe going skydiving. That's sexual too. He even said a really good meal is a sexual feeling. That I agree with. I, <laughs> I tend to have a very romantic relationship with the food that I eat, so I kind of get that one. So this remarkable ha drive that we have is called the libido. That's your sex drive. Um, and as you can imagine, which part of the psyche that belongs to, that's down there in the id, right? Your, your sexual needs are part of those basic instincts that we find in the id. Fortunately for us humans, um, our first experiences with pleasure begin when we are just babies. Um, and it begins with the simple act of sucking. Um, anytime that babies are given a bottle to drink from, or if they receive breast milk from the mother, this is what Freud called the oral phase, and this is where children receive pleasure through the mouth. Some people still get stuck in these phases. If you are someone who constantly chews gum, if you're a gum chewer, if you chew on your nails a lot, if you're a nail biter, if you chew on the end of your pen a lot, um, if you chomp on the ice after you finish a drink, I do that all the time. I love, I call it second drink. It's just more drink. So if you do any of those things, then it's kind of believed that we are stuck in the oral phase. There was something in our lives early on as babies that we, we didn't get enough of. Again, this is just according to how Freud uh, interpreted a situation. The next phase is the anal phase of development, um, and that's exactly what it sounds like, and this is where an infant learns the pleasure of pooping. That pooping feels really good. That never goes away. But more than that, after the baby poops and mom comes along to clean their, their bottoms, babies start to make the connection that, oh, God, that feels really, really good. I like that. And this is also a stage in a baby's life where they begin to learn um, control. If you've ever seen toddlers, and if you've been a grown up maybe around other little kids, and they're told to go to the bathroom to go poop, and they don't want to, that becomes control because that's something they can keep in or they can let out. So not only is that one of the stages of pleasure that Freud says that we experience as children, but the anal phase is where we begin to start to control what our body can and cannot do. And finally, in what's called the phallic phase, <laughs> this is where the infant learns that genitals, their private parts, feel really, really good when they get touched especially when mom comes along to bathe them or change them, they really, really like that experience. So in this stage, children are learning that if they touch certain parts of themselves, there's instant pleasure, and it's something they can do themselves anytime they want to. And this is where Freud said the drama of the Oedipus complex comes in. Just in case you're not familiar with the Greek mythology of Oedipus, just so you understand what it is, just so you have some background here, um, Oedipus was a baby who was born to a king and a queen. And a fortune teller comes along and tells the parents, look, you need, to, you need to know when this baby grows up, he is going to kill his father and marry his mother. And of course the parents are horrified and they don't want this to happen, so they leave the baby in the woods and that's it, they're done with him. 
Well, some shepherds come along and they find the baby and they bring the baby to the kingdom next door where a king and queen there who didn't have any children, they adopt Oedipus, but they never tell him that. Well, when Oedipus grows up, he eventually hears of the fortune that was told. So he comes to believe that he's going to kill his dad and marry his mom. So he leaves the kingdom and goes to travel to the kingdom next door to get away from the parents he loves. Well, along the way, he marries or he bumps into this, this poor beggar man on the road and kills him and then makes his way into the new kingdom where he meets the queen and falls in love and they have children together. Only then does he find out that the man he killed on the road was his biological father, the, the first king, and the woman he married is his biological mother. Well, he was horrified by what he had done, so uh, Oedipus ends up plucking his own eyes out to punish himself for what he had done. Well, Sigmund Freud heard the story and absolutely loved it. And he said, you know, I think I can, <laughs> I think I can use that. <laughs> I think I can use that to make sense of how children grow up. So according to Freud, the Oedipus complex works something like this. He said that a male child has a sexual connection with his mother since he learned to connect sexual pleasure with his mom taking care of him. So the boy becomes jealous of his father who gets to be with his mom and can take her away whenever he wants to. So the boy <laughs> begins to hate his father for taking the mom away from him. So the boy begins to fantasize about killing his dad in order to marry his mother to be with her sexually. And according to Freud, this happens to all boys roughly between the ages of three and six years old. Gentlemen in the room, do you remember feeling that way? Remember hating your dad so much you wanted to kill him so you could marry your mom and be with her? And then a little while later, roughly between the ages of 8 and 10, young boys make the shocking discovery that girls do not have a penis. And the boy is horrified. What happened to it? <laughs> Did it get cut off? What was she being punished for? Worst of all, could my penis get cut off too? And boys develop what Freud called castration anxiety. Uh, and this is where boys come to believe that their father had cut off their mother's penis for being a bad girl. And so the boy then begins to repress that desire for the mom. He gets so scared that his dad is going to cut off his penis that he decides, you know what, you can have mom. I'm not going to fight you for her. We're good. We're good, dad. You, you can have her. So once the boy gets over that phase, he begins to realize, well, I need to take the love and affection and passion that I have for my mother and put it on another woman outside of the family. And when the young man is able to do that, when he is able to get into a rela relationship with another woman, then he's able to grow into a healthy, reproducing heterosexual, a nice, healthy, straight guy who can make kids with another woman. Now remember, we're talking about Sigmund Freud. This is a very different time. Um, but that number three there, that was the goal for the men during that time period. And what about gay men? <laughs> well, who cares? Freud couldn't be bothered to figure them out. Well, what about you girls? Well, according to Freud, <laughs> when she sees a penis for the first time, she knows that she doesn't have one, but she really, really wants to have one. And instantly the girl feels ashamed that she doesn't have this wondrous, amazing thing between her legs. And so she develops something that Freud called penis envy. And this is around four to six years old. And so the girl begins to hate and resent her mother for not giving her a penis. And she wants to kill her mother and marry her father so that she can get to his penis. And Freud called this the Electra complex, which is an another myth. So this little girl officially becomes a woman when she understands that she can't have a penis, but she can only receive the penis. And she certainly can't get that from her father. She understands that that is wrong. So only then does she become a healthy reproducing heterosexual female when she realizes that she cannot receive her father's penis. She must receive it from another man instead. Do you remember that, ladies? Do you remember just your whole life wishing you could have a penis? And what about gay women? <laughs> Who cares? 
Freud couldn't be bothered to figure them out either. Uh, in fact, he said that since women don't develop as strong a superego as boys do, they shouldn't be allowed to serve as judges or become doctors or run for elected office because their minds aren't as firmly in place as that of a man's. Now, Freud's ideas are totally nut job, wacky crazy, and obviously don't belong in modern America. They didn't age well. I warned you that they wouldn't. For, for both boys and girls, it's just ludicrous. Um, and he admitted, to his credit, later in life, he said that women were the mystery he could not solve. He just, he couldn't figure them out. <laughs> and what he thought was a great formula for boys, what he thought worked really well to explain male sexuality, he believed he could just take that formula and just kind of force it into, into girls and explain how girls develop sexually. Well, one size does not fit all. You, you can't do that. And he realized later on that he was wrong, and he hoped that other researchers and psychoanalysis would take his ideas and fix them and improve them. Um, so he, he was a good man in that sense, where he said, maybe I didn't get this right, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and surprisingly, he was actually very much an ally to the queer community, LGBT people. Um, and to his credit, he was a very progressive man, and he actually believed that all human beings are born with the natural disposition to bisexuality. He said it is completely normal and natural to see what's attractive in not just the opposite sex, but the same sex as well. Um, and he said it was actually culture. It was the people, the society, that created the rules that made people feel okay with themselves or made them feel bad about themselves. And that was a very progressive thing to say, especially back in the Victorian era where pretty much everyone, they were like robots. Everyone was supposed to look and sound and behave exactly the same. It was a time of incredible pressure to conform and be like everybody else. Um, we still sort of see this today. You know, girls are very comfortable going up to other girls and saying, oh, you look really pretty. I, I wish my hair was like that. You look beautiful. But men don't do that. You know, guys don't go up to other guys and be like, you you look really hot today. You're really handsome. Like, we, we don't do that. And Freud said, there's nothing wrong with admiring beauty in the same sex as us. Society said, no, you can't do that. Can't do that. You have to deny that part of yourself. As badly as Freud's ideas about sexuality have aged, they have given us here in English something really useful. Um, one of those fun Easter eggs you can look for. Um, in the form of what's called phallic symbols, and this is sexual imagery. Uh, if you look at the blue side on the left, some male phallic symbols include anything in a story that's long, hard, straight, maybe serpentine, which means snake-like, you know, kind of curvy and bendy, <laughs> curves to the left, um, anything sharp like blades, swords, knives, and anything that shoots. Uh, for obvious reasons. If you think about a gun, where does it hang on a man? Well, down below the waist on his hip, and he just picks up that long thing and shoots it off. So you can see the symbolism there, depending on the story and it's how, how it's used. Um, and we can see some male imagery in Amanda's story, especially with the blades and knives, the slicing. Um, on the other side there, in red on the right, um, are female phallic symbols. And this is anything that's womb-like, warm, wet, and I'll say it just because people hate it, something moist, um, also penetrable, something that receives, sort of like a, like a tunnel. Um, bodies of water. We can see this in Amanda's story because she first meets Nama in a warm body of water in blood, so we can even make sort of a menstrual um, cycle connection to this as well. And phallic symbols for women also include anything that blooms, because women you know, give birth, they, they create and sustain life. Um, usually flowers, trees, anything that, that blooms and grows is associated with female sexuality. All this sex talk is important because Nama, being a sexual entity, and Amanda believes this entity is inside of her, she uses her sexuality to get what she wants. Sometimes it's casual sex just to fill a physical need. But in the case of her co-worker James, she uses sex in order to commit the second murder of the book. She's really angry at her co-worker James, who basically went and told on her, right? He went to the boss and said, you know, Amanda's not pulling her weight, she's not doing her job as well as she should. 
Um, and so the project that she loved and was working on gets taken from her and given to James. Well, this pisses her off, and it's not just making Amanda mad. Obviously, that's making Nama angry. Sort of like Mrs. Bates coming out of Norman Bates whenever she gets angry. And so she lures him into the park, most likely with the promise of some sexual act. Because if you remember, when they find James's body, the top of his pants have been unzipped and undone. So it looks like he was probably promised something in order to get him out into the dark and away from witnesses, away from nosy people and prying eyes. We don't know exactly how he died, but they do find blood around his head. So it's most likely Amanda probably found some object laying around. And it's a park. It could be a rock or maybe an empty glass bottle or something. And she bludgeoned him to death. She beat him to death. Before we leave the park totally, though, you might remember Amanda is enthralled. She's fascinated with this fountain. There's a, there's a fountain there in the park. And it's made up of the god Medusa. And if you think back to your high school education, back when you were reading mythology and everything, you might remember Medusa is that snake-haired goddess who can look a man right in the eye and turn him into stone. Why do you suppose Amanda would be obsessed with a figure like that? Well, Medusa, much like Nama, is a symbol of female strength and independence and power, right? Men don't get away from Nama. They don't get away from Medusa. They're able to defeat men in their stories. And of course, to men, that's very, very threatening. And so what's threatening to a guy is very empowering to Amanda. So of course, Medusa is going to, going to become another creature that she admires. Uh, but again, because it's about female empowerment, it's seen as monstrous and wrong. We know that her husband, Ed, is up to no good on his end as well, because he's spending whole weekends alone. He's having little secret phone calls with someone who he kind of hangs up from really quick. Um, so we can probably deduce that he is having an affair. Um, but I, I wonder, do you have any sympathy for Ed for cheating on Amanda? Do you feel bad for him at all? Usually when I ask that question in class, all the ladies are like, no. <laughs> no. Ed is an asshole and he shouldn't be cheating on his wife. But the entire story, we have focused on Amanda's needs, and it kind of makes sense why she would want to escape her life. But we really haven't talked a whole lot about Ed. He has needs and wants, right? He's, he's a part of this marriage, too. Um, and although it's really tempting and easy to write about Amanda or even Nama for an essay, Ed is a really good character you can kind of take a look at, too. And, of course, Amanda, as Nama, is able to get her revenge against Ed, uh, for destroying the marriage. She's, she's very upset that it's ending in spite of everything that's happened up to this point. Poor Ed is found, we can assume, slashed horribly to death. And we know that Amanda has a habit of slashing people. Um, and the blood splatter around the room, it's everywhere. It is, the blood is coating the carpet, the walls, the ceiling, everything. So we can assume this was really graphic and just a terrible way to die. And this comes after Ed has decided to tell Amanda that he does want a divorce, that he, he is going to move on with someone else, with another woman. And if you remember, written on the wall in blood, just above Ed's body, are two small, simple words, I win. If that's Nama speaking, then maybe the demon is telling us that, that she has gotten control, complete control over Amanda's body. But what if it's Amanda? What if Amanda wrote, I win? Well, she won, what, her, her freedom and her independence, a, a chance at a, a new life, whatever that life might look like. Whatever the reason, Amanda has won. Ultimately, Amanda pleads insanity, right? And she's sent away to a hospital for the criminally insane. It's a psychiatric, like extreme psychiatric hospital. But even there, she continues to cause trouble. She, she slashes another inmate. Again, she's going around cutting people. Uh, she's sleeping with one of the guards. And she's developed such a terrible and dangerous reputation for herself um, that she has a bunch of groupies, right? She has a bunch of sort of fans following her around. All along in these 
book talks about Come Closer, I've been telling you that when we get to the end of the story, there's a way that we'll be able to dismiss the whole supernatural part of the story as false, really quite easily. Um, so far, we've had two ways of interpreting this story. The first way is that Amanda is possessed, and that everything is happening because of this demon that she accidentally let in. We are going to dismiss that. Even though Amanda wants us to believe that, and she's wanted us to believe that since page one, we're going to dismiss that. We're not even going to consider that as, as fact. We're going to look at this with a little more logic and reason, a little more psychologically. So forget the supernatural. The second and probably more realistic interpretation of the story is that Amanda has created this fantasy in order to escape her dull and mundane life, to just sort of wipe the slate clean and start all over in such a way that she doesn't have to take responsibility for anything. Wasn't me, it was a demon. Demon did it. This would make escaping her own life easier and more attainable for her to be able to live life on her own. But this ending also opens up a third very realistic and plausible option for us. And that's that Amanda is insane. And I want you to consider some things that we're just discovering here in the last pages of this book. First of all, number one, the most important thing that you need to remember through all of this, whose point of view is the story told from? From Amanda, right? This is a first person story. So the entire thing is coming from Amanda. Hold on to that. Number two, the second really important thing you need to consider is that Amanda, right now, is in a mental institution. She is extremely mentally ill. And can we really trust a character in that state of mind to be telling us everything completely and truthfully and objectively? Probably not. This is really important. The fact that Amanda is in a mental institution at the end of the story um, I'm going to use my baby Jane doll. This is Amanda. And here she is in chapter 30, right? We find out at the end that she is in a hospital. But this is us, right? This is, this is Norman Bates. <laughs> He's going to be us. He's the reader, right? When we start reading a book, we're over here in chapter 1. And we start slowly making our way through the timeline of the story. And when we get to the end, we're surprised to learn that Amanda is in a hospital. But something we need to consider is this. Because she's telling us her story. She's telling us how she got here. That means in chapter one, when she starts telling us the story, she's already here. So that means everything here that happens in between, we really can't believe. And you might be thinking, well, there was some really good evidence there, right? The dog obviously senses something different about Amanda. Sister Maria sees the demon even without being told what she looks like. And the little girl, Claire, sees the demon stuck to Amanda. But remember, who is telling us this? This is all Amanda's words. We never hear from Sister Maria. She never talks to us. We never hear from the little girl. We never hear from Ed before he's killed. All of this is coming from Amanda. So we really can't trust anything she says because she could be making all of that up as proof. Like, see, Sister Maria saw it. Well, we don't know that because that's according to Amanda and nobody else. There might not even be a Sister Maria. Something else we established at the very beginning of this video is Amanda is a liar. And we have seen her lie in all kinds of different ways, in all kinds of situations. Can you trust someone who lies as often as she does? And my last point I want you to consider is as Amanda's telling her story, can she ever truly be neutral and objective and have no opinion whatsoever? Of course not. She has an agenda, right? She's trying to tell us, it wasn't me. It was Nama. It was this other thing making me do it all. And there's one more compelling reason that I want to show you for why Nama the demon doesn't actually exist except in Amanda's own mind. 
If you take a look at the final sentence of the book, Amanda's final line is this, and that's all I've ever wanted really, someone to love me and never leave me alone. Well, before you can love anyone else in your life, you have to truly and completely love yourself first. And isn't that something she struggled with all along? So it seems reasonable that she would make up something like Nama that could love her unconditionally. She missed out on the love of her mother and her, her father didn't seem to pay her much attention later and then she got stuck with the stepmom who didn't love her at all. So you have a little girl dealing with extreme abandonment issues. When Amanda grew into an adult, Ed came along and rescued her from her boring, empty life. Um, and made her change her ways and become healthier, become more engaged with the community around her. And then she lost that. And then, after her marriage and her career began to fail, who came along to rescue her? There was Nama. So throughout her entire life, Amanda has set up this recurring pattern that she is dependent on someone else to come in and save her from herself. She's never able to just be, be Amanda, be the best Amanda she can be, and improve her life through her own choices, her own willpower. And oddly enough, it only seems now that she's locked away in a psychiatric hospital, away from anyone who could possibly rescue her or influence her, that she seems to come into her own strong person, even if it now is behind bars. But she seems to find that validation. She finds that inner strength that she's been looking for her entire life. Now she's at a point she doesn't need anybody. All right, friends, that is it for today. Kind of a lot to unpack there in those last few chapters, but I hope you like the book. I hope these book talks have helped kind of given you a direction to move in with your essays so you know how to take some of those psychological concepts and apply them to the behaviors and actions that you're seeing in the book. I will be posting online some additional resources for you uh, as you work on completing this paper. I'll have a sample essay for you, as well as uh, some more little grammar punctuation stuff, a little guide there to help make your writing uh, very, very pretty and sparkly before you hand in this next paper. So um, look for that online, some additional advice and tips. And uh, again, email me anytime if you need anything. Um, I've enjoyed hearing from some of you, so um, I'm, I'm still here if you need me. So I will talk to you very soon. Uh, have a wonderful week. Stay healthy, stay well, and I will see you soon. All right, bye, 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 bye.